So what I'm going to hopefully do for you is first tell you three sort of key changes that are top of mind in the community to give you a sense of what some of those changes are and then to illustrate three key um, projects that have tried to work through some of the issues. So one of the key extremes um, and planning issues that are going to have to be dealt with with respect to climate change is that there are new flooding risks. Um, and a potential increase in damages. One of the implications of a changing climate is more intense precipitation events. But also think if you have warmer winters and where it's close to freezing and thawing, where in some instances if it's cold you'll get precipitation falling as snow, and if it's a little bit warmer it'll fall as rain. And certain parts of Canada, primarily more southern regions, that balance between below freezing and above freezing really has an impact in winter on whether you can have snow uh, precipitation accumulating as snow or running off and having the potential for winter flooding. Infrastructure with that int more intense precipitation uh, events accumulate in concert as well with other changes that are happening as well. So urban development, um, intensification, impervious, more impervious surfaces make urban areas more vulnerable to flooding events uh, if there's more intense precipitation. So then you have safety and performance issues as of your, di of your dikes, of your dams, etc. An innovation might be to think about the infrastructure and how one might keep more water on the land and infiltrating rather than running off. Another um, issue is if you have more intense precipitation events, and I'll show you how we, in, in a study on the Upper Thames, in terms of we have to reevaluate our floodplain management and emergency preparedness. Um, with more intense precipitation events, there's a likelihood for um, more areas being flooded, and so you have more structures and people exposed. On the other side is that we're also talking about an increased risk of low flow or drought. Summer and low flows may be um, lower and last longer. So even though if you're still, um, the dilution capacity of the water is not the same, even though you're putting in the same amount of effluent or something, it's not able to dilute. Also, you have that challenge of assimilating the pollutants. If you have low flow, there's a the potential for an increased demand if it's dry, and, and, and there's more supply. So there's a mismatch between the supply and the demand. We've talked about the concern for um, meeting the requirements of in-stream ecological needs and as well the economic needs and the needs of people and municipalities to provide drinking water, for example. So there is a tension there between apportionment of water. Lastly, in terms of some of the key issues with respect to climate changes related to water quality. So when you have more extreme precipitation events in urban areas, for example, in around the Great Lakes, there's a combined sewer overflows that cause um, pollution when they reach the lakes, for example. But in more um, um, agricultural and less urban areas, you have non-point source pollution. So that if rain falls on a farmer's field, for example, or on a field, there's the potential for erosion sediment transport. I, I also mentioned the low flow in streams and assimilating of pollution uh, pollutants. One thing that we are very certain is likely to happen and it will follow the air temperature is that water temperature is also likely to get warmer. That has implications for dissolved oxygen and fish as well as communities um, have taste and odor problems and algae problems related to warmer water temperatures. This is a long list of approaches. I'm going to highlight three. 
one of the key recommendations from the North American chapter was to think about ways of mainstreaming climate change into current programs and practices. Think about climate. Think of, don't think of it as something in the background that's going to be constant, but consider how the changes, potential changes in climate might affect things that you are of importance to you. So we talk about, I'm going to highlight three, three approaches, the impact assessment approach, where we explore what the likely impacts of a changing climate might be, for example, on a watershed. And that's to raise, raise awareness on what some of the impacts might be. Risk assessment, we talk about <coughs> vulnerability, the potential to suffer harm. Where are we vulnerable? Who is vulnerable? And what activities might be vulnerable or exposed because of the change in climate? <coughs> policy assessment looks at current policy regulations and identifies areas where they might be vulnerable or where they might, because of the, the um, regulations, may, might, may make people more vulnerable um, to changes in climate. And lastly is the adaptive management approach. And this is a, has been around for a, quite some time in biology, ecology, and it's thinking about, um, it's a way of addressing the uncertainty with respect to climate change. It recognizes that things are uncertain it recognizes that science doesn't stay st sit still, um, that it's learning and evolving. Information um, becomes more available. And people's values and needs change with time. And so melding all of those together um, is an adaptive management approach. So this is the first of the two, three case studies that I'm going to show you. And um, this is, I think what I would call an impacts approach. It's um, part of a guidance document that was developed for the province of Ontario, Ministry of Natural Resources and Ministry of Environment, um, under using the Credit Valley Conservation Authority and a subwatershed assessment as part of um, their assessment process. There's the guidance document on the right-hand side. And this is just a list of all of the various steps that we, we went through to undertake this assessment. You have to build scenarios or climate change scenarios. You have to develop your hydrologic model. You have to have a hydrologic model for the watershed so that you can understand and model the processes that are going to be um, taking place in the watershed flows, lake levels, groundwater, soil moisture. And you also have to link it into some kinds of informing policy or decision. And in this case, it was related to the Clean Water Act and the business, um, watershed assessments. This is just a, a map of the subwatershed um, 19 near Orange Bay to give you a bit of a grounding of where that is. So it's a scattered plot. And actually, it's something that I think is, if you're going to see people talking about climate change, I hope they use that to help communicate the diversity of future conditions that may occur in a particular region. What you have, what you see here, is along the bottom is temperature change. Along the side here is annual precipitation change, annual average. What this graph shows is how much the climate will change if you're comparing the current climate situation, 1961 to 1990, <coughs> to a future period, 2050. <coughs> looking at the future period from 2041 to 27. This is output from global climate models for the Orangeville area. Okay. And there is, I think there's over 50 different scenarios. So one of the questions is, which one's the best? Which one should I use? And I would say, beware, don't use one. 
because you will be invariably wrong. Part of the challenge, because you're dealing with uncertainty, you can't get a best answer. Because you have those different mission scenarios, different trajectories. So part of the challenge of dealing with climate change uncertainty is exploring those different climates. I call them practice climates. How to look at how a watershed might respond to a temperature increase of, let's say, two, around 2 degrees and a 5% increase in precipitation. How would it respond? Similarly, how might it respond to a temperature increase of 4.5 degrees and a precipitation increase of about 5%? So we use that kind of information to see how sensitive the watershed hydrology is to the driving influence of these new climates, these practice climates. So one of the outputs, um, and in this case, we explored um, nine different um, global climate scenarios and a number of other scenario generating techniques that have different pros and cons of using them. So this just summarizes by month the um, average flow over a 30 year modeling period of, um, of, as a result of the nine different scenarios and the dark black is the current climate as it's been modeled in the hydrologic model. So there's some key pieces of information that come out of using these nine different scenarios and running these scenarios in the same hydrologic model for your particular study region. In this case, it's showing that in most of the scenarios, if not all of them, <coughs> January flows will be higher. That's related to temperature and that whole issue of snow melt, rainfall, etc. because temperatures are warmer. And that process or impact carries on into March as well. Also indicate most, but not all of the scenarios indicate that the summer flows might also be lower. Okay, so I challenge you as experts in terms of your own watershed, what that might mean to things that resonate with you. How might you start to adapt or consider that um, and modify the things that you <coughs> expect or do because of those changes? The scenarios also try to determine whether there would be any changes in peak flows or maximum annual flows. And in this case, um, they identify some new potential um, extreme flows and timings thereof. This is, these are projections. They're practice climates and practice impacts. And their, their goal is to get people to think about how they might respond to this. And in the planning and in the policy development, how might I make things more resilient, be able to accommodate this? 